so we want to we want to turn it over to Austin. Yeah. So, okay. I think essentially the consensus is that our economy is obsessed with this idea of doing more with less. But what I've seen, we've obviously done more damage with less care. So how do we, you know, where do we start in countering these trends? Um, I'd like to make a reference to uh, this book I read, you know, The End of Poverty by Jeffrey Sachs. I read this in six, I'm sorry, not six, um, I was a big reader, you know, I've read many, many books, but um, it was 11th grade, the summer, my English teacher had uh, assigned this book because, you know, he was also, um, you know, a conscientious kind of uh, sustainable economics kind of guy, but um, obviously as an English teacher, it wasn't a specialty, but he recommended this book for summer reading research purposes. And, I was actually the only person who read this book, and we had an assignment, you know, planned for when we got back to school, and, you know, he canceled the assignment, and I was like, why did you, you cancel the assignment? I was so looking forward to doing this, and he was like, no, nobody read it, and I was like, all right, well, anyway, I read this book while I was uh, spending the summer on my cousin's uh, self-sustaining organic farm in North Carolina, and this, you know, was a life-changing experience for me. I, I grew up on Long Island where, you know, you talk about farming and people are just like either making fun of you or, you know, it's just like talking to a brick wall. You know, people just don't get it. They're obsessed with material things, the next style, you know, Jersey Shore or whatever, Kim Kardashian. Um, you know, it's a very, Long Island is very peculiar. Um, anyway, so I came back from this farm and, you know, I'm, I'm just like flannel cowboy boots and, you know, I'm in high school where, you know, everybody else is totally not dressed like that. So I, I, I got my fair share of criticism, but. Either way, um, back to the, the book, it's The End of Poverty. Jeffrey Sachs basically outlined the economy like a human body and said we need to diagnose the economy like we would diagnose a human body. And the, the, basically it came out to be if we were to diagnose our economy, the, this human body would be dead. You know, <laughs> essentially it would be dead. So we need to really change how we think about how every single you know, thing that we do really, you know, uh, contributes to the bigger picture, which is maintaining the system as a whole. It's health, you know, it's sustainability. And so I, I founded the Red Giant Union because I had this vision, you know, that we can do this, we can achieve this. Um, but how do we, you know, make that push? How do we inspire people? You know, because that's really where it is. It's the engagement, it's the local engagement. Uh, the personal engagement, and um, as uh, the gentleman earlier, um, our our tap has, has suggested the social capital, the symbolism, and all that. That is important. I agree. You know, so essentially, this is uh, where we're at and why we're here. A short video that I uh, created with another um, uh, producer out of uh, Logansport. You know, I like to keep my connections local. Uh, but anyway, he he happened to be a, a voiceover, so. A professional voiceover, so people might think it's a computer speaking, it's actually not, it's a real man. <laughs> The stars are a source of inspiration, guidance, and stories. Educators, entrepreneurs, artists, and philosophers, for example, are all stars. Some fizzle out peacefully. Others will explode in a spectacular event that is bright enough to briefly outshine all the stars in the galaxies. It's called a supernova. This is Antares, a red supergiant also known as the heart of Scorpio, Lord of the Sea, creator of prosperity. It has been said that Antares demands we take a stand for our truth against the established conditions of our personal lives and against the established order of authority directing our lives when those conditions and that authority are no longer in our best interest, nor supporting our evolutionary freedom. And Terry's ensures growth, evolution, and change. It is also expected to supernova.
At the core of our evolution is sustenance and survival, and a search for a better way. To do more with less. 200 years ago, 98% of the population was involved with agriculture. Now, less than 2%. Quality has been sacrificed for convenience, and our health is degrading. The majority of food is imported, frozen, or otherwise processed. Commercial production of food is extremely resource intensive. Your average hamburger contains 2,600 gallons of water to produce the beef patty, 5 gallons of water to produce the lettuce, and 15 gallons of water to produce the bread. Right now, water is a national concern. We are facing extreme water shortages in the next 10 years. There's a better way to do more with less. Innovators have transformed agriculture in ways that have yet to become mainstream. The transition is leading to a new agricultural revolution, sprouting first in urban communities where fresh produce is scarce and reconnecting us with a healthier way of life. The Red Giant Union shares this vision. Since before our foundation as a public charity in November of 2015, together we've been working to establish groundbreaking opportunities, integrating world-leading methods. We are addressing the next generation of food challenges while inspiring community engagement. Over 800 million people around the world now encourage you to join this movement to make a difference, to directly influence the quality and affordability of your food, to enable the leadership of your local community, to be an agent for change. It's not just farming. We grow food to save the world. And we welcome your donation at redgiantunion.org. Thank you, everyone. Uh, 
uh, maybe we couldn't do that 30, 40 years ago, but in the last 20 years they've developed technology where we now can do that, and it's called aeroponics. Um, you know, bees are obviously dying because of new, new, I can't pronounce that word, I'm not a scientist. Um, anyway, what? Neonicotinoids. Neonicotinoids. Okay. Um, so yeah, we need to get rid of practices that are killing bees. Um, Lake Mead is, you know, ha lost his, uh, has lost half of its uh, power and water. Um, and so, as we also lose water, we lose power to the region. We lose, you know, the water that's feeding wildlife and, and you know, ourselves as well. Um, so essentially, the world's waking up, and no one person can solve these problems. So we do need to act together, and that's why, you know, coming back to the symbolism of the red giant, it's you know about the masses, you know, and what better influence can we make than the masses coming together? You know, it's something that we can, uh, you know, we can do something that is more significant than and bigger than all of us combined. Uh, and the red giants are actually the biggest stars in the universe, the, the most massive. You know, you, you stand it next to a sun and it's a little pin dot. You know, our Earth's sun is a little pin uh, compared to it. Um, so we, we are addressing carbon footprint, uh, global warming, pesticides, and of course, no bigger issue than water. Um, and over the last hundred years, we've lost 264 trillion gallons of our water reservoir. Prehistoric, it's not replaceable. So this idea that water, there's abundant water, you know, again, is, is a myth. Um, and in the past decade, we, we've used that water three times faster due to drought and modern farming practices. Uh, so it comes down to if we don't do something now, you know, and that's why I say, like, now is the time, it's not tomorrow, it's not, you know, let's wait another four years, let's do some research. No, the research has been done, we have the answers, we have the solutions, and we have been implementing these uh, over the last ten years. Um, but if we, you know, if we don't keep doing what we're doing, one third of all humanity will experience chronic to severe water shortages by 2025. And honestly, I don't want to live in that kind of world. Um, so overall, can be clearly stated that our methods have become counterproductive, illogical, and unsustainable, all because of the pressure on less than 2% of the population to produce our food. Uh, now, to the real cool stuff, because I assure you, all that, although it might sound bad, there is a lot of good news to follow up. <laughs> now, you know, I'm one to always believe that food should be an experience, not just a convenience. You know, uh, going to the grocery store and getting a canned food might be a convenience, but it's not inspiring. You know, what have you achieved for yourself? Like, you know, Stephen Ritz, for instance, uh, I don't know if you can really see it, but essentially Stephen Ritz is uh, from the Green Bronx Machine. And, uh, or he started the Green Bronx Machine in uh, Bronx, New York, uh, in a neighborhood that was experiencing 40% unemployment, 40% uh, graduation rate, and like 50% attendance. And on top of that, kids were getting fatter, kids were getting sicker, there was hardly any local food production, it was a fresh food desert, you know, urban community, and, you know, and um, he had, he wasn't a farmer himself when he, when he began. He uh, saw, or he was a, uh, he was sent a package of seeds, you know, from a friend that he completely just disregarded. He put it behind the radiator in his classroom, and you know, the steam from the radiator uh, eventually, you know, somehow had sprouted some of those seeds, and he noticed like all the kids, you know, sixth graders were running to the window to look at these seeds, you know, that were sprouting, and he. A light bulb went off in his head where, you know, this is inspiring, this is engaging, you know, I can do something with this. So we did, and next thing you know, sorry, I get a little emotional because, like, it's super, like, awesome. I mean, it, it, I've, 
I have experienced a lot in the last uh, two years, you know, in this world of aeroponics that, you know, the stories I've heard are just absolutely amazing, absolutely inspiring, and it's exactly what we need. Um, so he decided to start growing food in his school on a major level. He started with, you know, uh, raised beds. Still wasn't enough. It was, it was cool, but, you know, it was still hard work, a lot of labor, kids were, kids kind of like, some kids liked it, others didn't. Um, and now uh, he's gotten into aeroponics and he uh, raised $30,000 to build a aeroponic farm like two stories up in his uh, public school where now kids are growing their own food they're, um, and they're doing it easily. They're, it, it's you know waking them up to like a new way of producing food as well. Um, and he's turned his school from 40% uh, graduation to 100% graduation, and from 50% attendance to 100% attendance. I mean, that was never before seen, at least not in our generation in the Bronx. And uh, so he was then nominated for the Global Teacher Prize. And this is like only one person, you know, in this world that, you know, among many of many others, you know, and we can all do something like that, you know, it's growing food in a school, that's easy, you know, now it's even easier. So, this is what I call the good greenhouse effect, <laughs> you know, we can absolutely have, um, we can inspire, or we can grow minds and harvest dreams, I like to say. Um, so, the Red Giant Union wants to do that too, you know, we want to supply the local, uh, want the public to actually supply itself with locally grown non-GMO produce. Uh, we want to utilize and pioneer world-leading methods, um, and aeroponics is one of them. And we want to build careers, and we also want to give you an experience with food above all else. You know, we want that experience to be inspiring and engaging and make you also want to do it yourself. So, I want to just show you this uh, clip too about aeroponics in, um, in New York City. From the rooftops of New York City to the vacant lots of Detroit, there's a growing movement to change the way we eat. Join us as Food Forward explores the explosion of urban agriculture across America and meet the food rebels who are growing food right where we live. My name is John Mooney. I've basically been in the restaurant business my whole life. I've never made money doing anything other than being part of a restaurant crew from start to finish since about 12, 13 years old. I have done some conventional farming projects to supply restaurants that I've done in the past. It's very difficult to manage, very difficult to maintain. So I looked into alternative forms of farming. In an urban setting, I felt with the dead space of the rooftop, the technology was smart. It just makes sense. We're in the West Village of Manhattan. We're standing here in the middle of my, uh, my hydroponic rooftop farm. In the beginning, there was a lot of uh, curiosity as to what was going on up here because it looks kind of space age from a distance. <laughs> and I've explained it by phone or, you know, in person. And now I'm at the point where I tell everyone you have to see it. The seed sits inside this net, where the roots grow inside the tower. This big cylinder has a pump that trickles water down the sides, and that feeds the roots, and that recycles the nutrients through the bottom. is a big base filled with around four gallons of the nutrients, which is fed naturally by gravity. What I do is I pull the cup out of the tower. So you see how nice and lightly colored the roots are. And look how long they get, right? I mean, that's strong. Let's look at this arugula right here, okay? We just pulled that a few hours ago. I broke it down, roots attached. You see what I'm doing. And uh, I believe it totally makes a difference. The flavor is absolutely amazing. When you enter the garden from the stairwell and open that door, it's kind of like a sanctuary of sorts. 
So that's just one example, and he's the first uh, vertical aeroponic uh, rooftop farm in New York City, and he also has a vision of you know having these on all green roofs. Um, that's something that we can definitely do. Um, you know, one thing, the reason I started a nonprofit though is because really I'm, I'm more concerned with the reallocation of funds instead of the pocketing of funds. You know, I think if we uh, focus our efforts on you know a more direct way of like getting the funds to be accessible to people who want to start doing these things because honestly aeroponics is extremely uh, expensive you know to start um, it's a really high investment but it uh, over time it really pays itself off and it's better than what we've been doing and it's also a part of the solution. So if we can create more accessibility to funds and resources, I definitely think more people will you know, get on board just because they'll have somewhere where they can go, hey, uh, you know, apply for this grant from the Red Giant Union and you know, they'll, they'll make it happen for you. you know, they'll supply resources, they'll, they'll supply the consulting, um, you know, and they'll put you through the experience. So, um, this is, uh, I'm sorry, I'll go right, this is just another restaurant in uh, Los Angeles that's using it. This is a video from the Green Rocks Machine, about one minute. There is a myth that marginalized communities want cheaper food. No, they want healthy food. I have 200 pounds, 6th graders, and to me, that's appalling. I can't accept that. It's just not right. Listen, when kids lose weight, when they go home and they're bringing food home to their families, and grandparents are getting involved, and parents are getting involved, and people are talking about what's going in their bodies. Plant by plant, classroom by classroom, we're changing outcomes, we're changing destinies. kids who are teachers now. I have kids who are aspiring to things and jobs and places that they never imagined. That to me is exciting. Put a seed in the ground. Put a seed in the ground. It's that simple. By the way, this presentation is putting you through the aeroponic experience. Uh, that was my intention. Uh, I did not invent the tower garden. The tower garden actually came from uh, the uh, research in the Epcot Center. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Epcot Center at Disney World. They grow, you know, food with, uh, you know, futuristic or essentially, you know, today's uh, technology um, in, in order to, you know, address, you know, things like water shortages and other, uh, you know, global concerns. So now they finally made this available to the public. Um, and that's uh, over the past uh, 10 years uh, after they established uh, Future Growing. Uh, Tim Blank was a chief horticulturalist at uh, the Epcot Center for 14 years before he started Future Growing. And his mission was to basically bring you know, the future to the public uh, instead of it being exclusively for Disney World. So, uh, and once he did, you know, it, it kind of it blew up, you know, people got it, but only very few so far have actually implemented it, and I think we need to do this on a much larger scale, and we need to keep doing it and keep pushing for it. Um, and, you know, schools too, I'm sorry, schools are something that we can get into with, uh, as you see with the Green Box Machine, but, you know, it doesn't always have to be, uh, like, a super crazy kind of thing, and, you know, it can be simple like this. for us to start this and let you all experiment with growing plants, eating some of your own plants, maybe taking some of them home to your parents and sharing that way. I'm Lee Fisher. My wife and I own a little company of fire called Mitch State Hobby Center. We've been there uh, 25 years and I'm proud to be an American business. I'm not proud to be a part of something that gives back. And folks, isn't this amazing right here? 
It is amazing. This is the beginning of children feeding children and the rest of their community. And what a legacy it is to leave here. And it all starts right here. Yeah, you know, it just shows like 
like she said in the beginning, she killed every single one of her gardens until she got a tower garden. So it's not as intimidating now to grow your own food as it used to be. And even if you don't have, you know, the, the, enough space, if you own any land, you can still grow food. There's really no more excuses now. So, and it, we're all, on top of that, we're being a part of the solution because get this, the tower garden uses 90% less water than traditional farming. And if, if you look at, you know, that, uh, you know, burger before, like what took five gallons of water to produce a, a little thing of lettuce uh, takes only an eighth of a gallon in a tower garden. On top of that, it's growing 30% greater yield. It, uh, you know, the nutrient supply is packed with everything and more than what you usually get in the soil to give the plant really everything it needs, the macronutrients, the micronutrients. So, you know, they're They've given you a solution and, you know, it's 30% greater yield in 25% less time because really the plants are growing at their full potential. You know, they're growing faster, you know, than normal just because they're only getting what they need, you know, and if they're lacking that in the soil, they're a little bit slower, the climate might make them grow a little slower. Um, so if you're, you're growing in an aeroponic system, they're going to get everything they need and they're going to grow fast, extremely fast, because that's how they would naturally do if they were given everything they need.